Here's a dumb little riddle for you. I rise when the sun is already setting, am very pale, have frightening eating habits, and retreat to my dark abode just before the sun begins to rise. What am I? If you said vampire, then I'm sorry to disappoint, but there's no nose for Atus here. I'm a night shift worker. It's not that bad, though. I've been night shift for a while now, and the only hard adjustments I had to make, other than completely reshaping my circadian rhythm, was getting used to saying good morning to people before I go to bed. Honestly, I've worked crappy retail jobs before, and I'd much rather live like an unholy bloodsucker so long as I never have to see a long-ass line of completely full shopping carts stack up again. My job I currently have isn't that bad, although it is a little weird. Have you ever heard of a dollhouse? Of course you have. But have you ever heard of a capital D, capital H dollhouse? Well, allow me to explain. It's a brothel, where people can have sex with a lifelike love doll. The dollhouse I currently work at is called Madame Molly's Hall of Dollies. Now I'm going to answer some questions that I know you want to ask. Ew, do you have to clean those things after they're used? Yes, but our clients sign an agreement saying they'll use a condom. And if they don't, then we charge them for the doll and replace the contaminated one regardless if the client used it to completion. Another common question is, what are the clients like? Are they creepy? I bet they're creepy. Sometimes, but we mainly get drunk people stumbling in due to the fact the Hall of Dolls is directly behind a popular strip club. Madame Molly's Hall of Dollies is a repurposed motel boasting 30 rooms and a cast of 45 dolls. Drunk people who are feeling a little frisky from the strip club will stagger in, ask for a doll that resembles a stripper from the club, and if that room isn't due for a sterilization, I hand them the proper room key. Since most of our clients' clientele is under the influence to some degree, I have a security guy who looks a lot like human thumbs sitting in the corner of the lobby, just waiting to throw someone out. He's a good guy. His name is Patrick and he does not appreciate Spongebob jokes. Time for the last question you're waiting to ask. What's the weirdest thing you've seen at Madame Molly's Hall of Dollies? Well, this is where I usually feel my blood begin to chill over. My shift isn't necessarily busy, but there's typically a steady flow of patrons that come into the Hall of Dolls. That night, however, was dead. It was one of those nights where you learn the pattern of songs that play on repeat over the sound system. I could hear the dull thump of the club's bass rattle through the lobby. Patrick was bobbing his head up and down, trying desperately to fight sleep. I would have just passed the time by mindlessly scrolling through Facebook, but I get close to no service where I work. So, instead, I resigned myself to just doodling on some stray printer paper I found. Four hours into the shift had passed, four hours of doodling and blankly staring through the windows clouded by night. The music changed abruptly, which was odd because, like I said, there was a pattern. Every day, by Buddy Holly suddenly emerged through a hiss of static. Just as Buddy began singing, the door opened. A tall, gaunt man in a black suit with bright red lips walked up to the counter. Good afternoon. I'm here to patronize this business, the gaunt man said. His appearance took me back for a second. His skin was as smooth as plastic. 
and just as white as his eyes. Dotted in the center of his difficult-to-discern eyes were two pitch-black circles, which seemed more like dark holes where light could neither enter nor escape, rather than irises. I regained my professionalism and asked, What kind of company are you looking for tonight? The man pressed the back of his two fingers to his lips, like he was trying to convey he was thinking, or something. It was as if a person with no habits was trying to pretend they had habits. When he brought his hand back down, his red lips were smudged. It was clearer than he was wearing lipstick, like he was trying to hide his slit-like mouth. I will take room 22, the one with the female who has blue hair. My stomach began to turn. How could he know that doll is in there? We don't assign dolls to specific rooms or anything, I thought to myself. I looked over at Patrick to see if he was seeing any of this. Patrick was sitting straight up, his arms were placed straight along his lap, his eyes were wide and unblinking. My fingers trembled as I handed him the key to room 22. The man extended his hand out, I placed the key into his creaseless palm. When he closed his hand, his skin folded like were a rubber glove. I was so creeped out, I forgot to have him sign the Hall of Dolls agreement, and even forgot to provide him with a condom. Hell, I didn't even ask for payment. The man walked down the hallway like he was in a stop-motion movie, all herky-jerky. As he disappeared into room 22, Buddy Holly hissed back out of the sound system, and the normal playlist resumed. I looked over to Patrick, and he was once again sleeping with his arms crossed. When I looked at the clock, it read 1 a.m., which meant I was five hours into my shift. I was trying to think now I had lost an entire hour for what I had felt like a ten-minute interaction. My eyes kept darting between the clock, Patrick, and room 22. An hour had gone by before the music hissed into Every Day by Buddy Holly once again. Patrick was sitting perfectly straight again. The door to room 22 swung open quickly. A pulsing light spilled into the hallway from the room. I could hear the lamp clicking on and off in a steady interval. I eventually gained the courage to investigate. The light continually clicked on and off as I walked toward the room, but just as I was about to walk into the room, the light clicked on and stayed on. As I passed the threshold of the door, I was confronted with something I didn't quite understand at first. A head with blue hair was laying on the floor. It was placed perfectly on the floor at the front of the bed, almost intentionally so it would be staring at me as soon as I walked in. It was the doll's head, which was a relief, but what made my stomach turn what was on the bed? The doll's body was laying on the bed, with its legs removed at the middle of the thigh. They were neatly placed at the right side of the doll's torso. The fingers were removed, but placed near the corresponding points of separation. A large cut was made down the middle of the torso, as if it had been dissected. In the center of the dissection were a bunch of smaller, more savage cuts, like the man had been frustrated and was frantically looking for organs that weren't there. I called out for Patrick in a desperate scream, but he was still sitting completely motionless. My breathing became shallow and quick. There was no window in this room, and I didn't see the man leave, so he should still be here. With a knife. The door to the bathroom opened and a hot chill shot through my body, but no one was inside. Acting on sheer impulse, I slammed my body into the bathroom door, hoping he was on the other side and I could pin him to the wall. But the bathroom door collided with drywall instead. I slowly retreated from room 22, never once turning my back to that room. Once I was in the hallway, I heard a chorus of doors quickly opening in perfect harmony. All lamps from all rooms were pulsing on and off once again. Every day, by Buddy Holly swelled louder and louder. I timidly walked down the hallway, peeking into each room quickly, and they all offered the same display. The dolls were all sitting upright, with their backs facing me, but their heads turned around to also face me. Once I returned to the lobby, the music hissed back to the normal playlist again. I looked back down the hallway, and all the doors were shut once again. I woke Patrick up and showed him the dolls. Thank God they didn't just magically repair themselves. We called the police and filed a report. I left out all the things I couldn't explain, of course. Patrick later told me that he had no idea how we had lost so much time. 
One minute it was 8 p.m., and the next it was 3 a.m. I didn't want to tell him about how he was just sitting and staring motionlessly. That was the weirdest thing that happened to me at Madame Molly's House of Dollies, and I honestly can't explain. I still work there, it's hard to get a job you can actually tolerate nowadays. I figure if I'm traumatized two more times, then I'll start looking for other jobs, but for now, I just hope I don't see that tall gaunt man walk through those doors ever again. That night, when I got home, I was finally able to check my Facebook, and I saw a lot of posts about unknown lights in the sky. I'm an overnight security guard for a large building parking ramp. It's generally a really quiet job with a lot of free time, but occasionally I do have to kick out homeless people. It's a horrible part of the job, and I do my best to direct them to the next safest place to sleep. Most people are understanding, as they unfortunately go through this a lot. If anything, they want to vent, and I try to be an open ear. Our protocol is to ask them to leave, then if they don't, tell them to leave, and if all else fails, we have to contact the police. I've only once gotten to that last step. It's important to note my general routine at work. I sit in a shack in the parking room for an hour, then I go for a walk around the building, and then back to the shack. The doors are all locked, but there's an entryway with an ATM that's open 24-7. This is usually where I find people looking for a place to sleep. For more context, I'm a smaller woman and unarmed. On this night, there is a woman trying to sleep by the ATM. I followed protocol, and after the first two warnings, I had to contact the police. She yelled at me, which is out of the normal, but understandable, considering her position. It must be frustrating being constantly kicked out of every semi-safe space. Police arrived, and because I was a little scared, I always am, I watched from inside the building, out of view, to make sure they got her out. If she was yelling at me, she was full-on screaming at them. This goes on for about half an hour before she leaves the building. Unfortunately, that's all the cops are required to do, so she makes her way to the bus stop right outside. The problem with this is the bus stop is parallel with my shack. She just sits and stares at me with hatred in her eyes. This gets uncomfortable pretty quickly, so I decided to take another walk. When I'm passing the door that leads out to my shack, I decide to take a peek out of the little door window. I don't usually do this, but I felt uneasy knowing she was probably still in the area. And it's a good thing I did. I can just barely see it, but behind my shack I see the slightest wobble. There she was, hiding right behind my shack. It's not a big thing, maybe a ten foot cube made out of large windows and metal right at the entrance of the parking ramp. I have no doubt she was waiting for me. I call the police and just keep watching from the little door window. While I'm waiting, she eventually lets out an angry scream, kicks the miscellaneous junk in front of the shack, and storms up the stairwell on the parking ramp. For an extra kick of anxiety, the floor above me had a broken door that wasn't locked at the time. Eventually, police get there, and after some harsh words, they get her to leave again, and this time she walks off into the night. What really scares me is what I found on my next walk. There's a mirror next to the door I was watching her from. I could see it from inside, but from this side it was obvious. She had broken the mirror and a large piece was missing. Maybe I've allowed my anxiety to build all this up in my head, but from my perspective, she had taken a large sharp object, hid behind my shack, and waited for me to walk up. You tell me if I'm overreacting, but to my nameless potential assailant. I wish you better times and a bed to sleep in, but I also hope we never meet again. Do you love me? Nothing was peculiar, creepy, or out of the ordinary the morning that it happened beyond the rain. The light drizzle bounced against my windshield as I cruised steadily down the same highway I always did on my route home from work, a graveyard shift agreement with a diner far too out of the way for me to have found interest in. But I genuinely enjoyed the work and jobs were difficult to come by in the village I'd spent my entire life rotting away in. My parents and friends often argued with me about how ridiculous the one-way hour drive was. 
weighing out the pros and the cons, and always determining that it just wasn't worth it. But I loved being in a new place with people who never recognized me unless I allowed them to. It was around 3.15am when I saw it. A light blue Mazda with its hood up and a beautiful young lady beside it on the side of the road just a few strides up the road from me. I made the quick decision to pull over considering the rain and the unfortunate hour. Need some help? Maybe a lift? I asked as soon as I'd stepped out into the rain. She was more beautiful up close and in person in her own unique way. She wasn't a woman I would consider drop-dead gorgeous, and she fit no conventional standards of the word, but my heart skipped to more beats than I'd like to admit, hoping she'd agree to a ride. She was reluctant at first, and kept insisting that she was fine and that where she was headed was much too far out of the way. But after some convincing and assurance that I had no problem taking her wherever she needed to be, I found her seated in my passenger seat as I fumbled with the ignition through blushed cheeks. Thank you for this, she smiled at me as I began to pull back into the road. There's no one else who loves me enough to help. I'm sure that can't be true, I said. Well, do you love me? I felt her staring through me as I kept my eyes forward and was noticeably taken aback by the question. Well, I mean, you seem great, but we've only just met. But I'm sure... I was humiliated at the way I stumbled over my words, but who wouldn't? She let out a bellowing laugh and smirked at me as my cherry red cheeks burned even more than they had been. Well, that settles it. I'm, I'm sorry. Your name? Matt. Of course you don't love me, Matt. No one does. The comment, while concerning and dark, was stated with a still steady smile and a continued upbeat tone. If not for her demeanor, I would have become gravely uncomfortable. It was then that I realized I'd never even asked her where we were headed, and she read me the address of a gas station about 20 minutes in the opposite direction. Are you sure that's where you want to go? I mean, there's a gas station right up the road from here. Or, I could even find one closer to a mechanic. I know a really good one. She stopped me before I could finish. If you don't mind the drive too much, I'd really like to go. Uh, this one, it's closer to home, and I'm sure someone might be more willing to pick me up there. It was an odd request that left a lot of questions, all of which I was sure she either wouldn't answer or would wave off given her absolute certainty of this specific station. Why wouldn't you just have me drop you off at your house then? I wondered, but chose not to ask. She wanted this gas station. I said I'd drive her wherever, so be it. We made small talk all the way there, which I was both thankful and anxious over. She made no more odd or uncomfortable comments and said nothing that caused too much concern, but something about her drew me in, and I only wanted to know more about the stranger I was hauling back in the direction of where I'd left. I'm sorry for making you uneasy earlier, she blurted suddenly. I could tell you were uncomfortable. I've not been myself lately with the year I've had. You wouldn't believe it. Despite the embarrassment I felt as we drew our conversation back to my clear discomfort and humiliating fumbling, I jumped at the opportunity to learn more. It's fine, really. Is the car not the worst of your troubles? If you don't mind me asking. No, no, no. Not at all. I guess that's why I've been so calm about it. Normally I'd throw a fit over such a minor inconvenience. She never stopped smiling. I've come to realize that there's so much more to worry over. I mean, I hate to overshare, but I've just got to let it out. Go on, I'm all ears. She sighed, and for the first time since I picked her up, she let a smile drop and leaned her head back as she stared out the passenger window. A moment of silence filled the car, and I'd wondered if she heard me wrong or didn't hear me at all. Just as I was about to repeat myself, she spoke, slowly and carefully, as if she wasn't sure she could trust me with such precious information. I've made many mistakes in my life, too many to count. My biggest has to be s selling myself. She glanced over at me as she said it, trying to gauge my reaction. Selling my entire self, I mean, not just my body, but my heart, 
my soul, my mind, all of my love. I sold all for a better life. It meant losing all sense of judgment, all morality, every last bit of goodness I had left. When she realized that my reaction would not change, she turned back toward the window and let her head drop against the glass. He was lovely, old of course, but I really thought I'd found my soulmate. Someone I could finally surrender myself to, you know? That's what I thought, until he ended it. Was it bad? I questioned, making sure not to address the gigantic prostitute elephant in the room. She was delicate and needed someone, that much was evident. But I couldn't wrap my head around it. She was beautiful, well-spoken, and seemed intelligent enough. I would have never guessed it about her at first glance. I chewed myself out for assuming that anyone ever could. She let a smile return to her still-slit face, but her eyes looked glossed over. I didn't think she cried at all, but I was driving and never got a complete look at her. It was... it was bad. He was married, and I knew that, but something told me that I was different. I was a fool for thinking that. She chuckled to herself. Stupid. He told me that she'd gotten pregnant and I had to stay away from him. That everything we shared together was nothing, and that if I tried to contact him again, he'd get a restraining order. Silence fell over the space we shared for a moment, until she spoke again. It wasn't nothing to me. My heart ached for her. She was still a stranger to me, but I remember feeling like I should hold her, or at least reach for her hand. But I didn't. The remainder of the ride was left with no conversation as I squirmed behind the wheel and itched for anything to say at all. Something told me that nothing I could conjure up would help her. We arrived at the station not long after that, and she quickly thanked me for the ride as she got out, shut the door behind her, and shuffled inside. I smacked myself in the head for being so awkward to someone in a vulnerable state, but to be fair to myself, I was never good at providing comfort. I left feeling humiliated and ashamed. The incident with the unnamed girl left me with a lot of unanswered questions and a bit of grief sprinkled with humiliation but I tried to get it out of my mind and go about my morning without thinking much of it. It was six o'clock that morning when I saw it on the news. Her face, her name, and a warrant for her arrest. Police are searching for a murder suspect, Ashley Marshall. She sat in my TV screen exactly as I'd remembered, dark-haired with bright eyes and the familiar smile she'd sat displaying right beside me that morning. What could she possibly have done? Who could that girl, bright and bubbly and sweet, have hurt? I toyed with the idea of calling in a tip for a moment before remembering what she told me about her lover. That night, I went to sleep telling myself that I'd owed it to Ashley to forget what I saw and pretend it never happened. Nobody could trace her back to me, right? Someone would find her eventually, and then she'd become someone else's problem. The attendant had seen her, maybe he'd call it in. I woke up the next morning feeling content with my decision and made a vow with myself not to overthink it. The madness ate at me until the early afternoon when I decided to go for a drive to clear my head. I'll go about my life as normal. I won't watch the news and I won't think about where she is or what she's done or... Hi Matt. The familiar voice hit my eardrum accompanied with the feeling of intense pressure, almost as if I were underwater. In the passenger seat of my beat-up pickup sat Ashley, just as I'd left her the morning before. Ashley? Met with the grin that burned in my memory. You know. I decided it best not to draw too much attention to myself for the criminal on the run and suggested we talk inside, but she insisted I drive her. Where, I asked. The gas station. I agreed without probing and asked nothing. The 40-minute drive was filled with small talk and casual conversation that she seemed to delight in. Of course, I was distracted by the newfound discovery of who she was and what she'd done, but it didn't seem to faze her. We both knew it. We both knew that the other knew it. But it wasn't ever addressed. I didn't want to address it. When we arrived at the same station from yesterday, she turned to me reluctant to leave. Can I ask you something? Of course. Do you love me? She asked with confidence once more, eyes never leaving mine. 
I couldn't speak. Was she crazy? Why would she keep asking me, a stranger, such a personal question with an obvious answer? I didn't know her. I didn't even know her name until last night. Her smile dropped and eyes left mine as she gently shut my passenger door and headed for the entrance. That's when I noticed she'd left her phone on the seat and decided to wait for her to come back looking for it. Perfect, I thought. She'll come back asking for it, and I'll apologize. After about 20 minutes of waiting, I decided she wasn't going to come back. I grabbed her phone and walked towards the front door. I'll just give it to her, apologize, and leave. Anything beyond that is going to make this worse than it is. There was no sign of her in the gas station, the bathroom door was locked, and my knocking was met with silence on the other side. Hello? Ashley? You left your phone in my car, I wanted to apologize. Silence. Hello? More silence. I chalked it up to her probably wanting to rid herself of me in the entire situation and slid the phone under the door. Despite my earlier made promise to myself to stay away from the news, her reappearance left me needing answers. There had to have been some reason for the second trip. Maybe she turned herself in. I sat in front of the television with the anticipation boiling inside of me, waiting for 6 o'clock. I wish I hadn't. A new development in the Ashley Marshall case. The suspect in the murder of Thomas Marshall has led investigators to a small gas station outside of Route 70 this morning, where the suspect found unresponsive. This morning, I dropped her back off at the station at 2 p.m. My vision blurred as I learned more about the woman I'd driven that afternoon hours after her confirmed death. She was a wonderful person, an English professor, a mentor, a charitable and caring woman who loved her students and loved her job. I now knew that she was married to a powerful man. I now knew that she was three months into her first pregnancy. I now knew that she, the note she left at the scene of his murder discussed his affair and the way that it tortured her to realize that she was not loved by anyone, as she stated. I couldn't sleep that night. How could anyone? I had no indication at all that she wasn't who she said she was, that she'd been posing as the mistress of the man she stabbed to death. I racked my memory in an attempt to find any clue that she was plotting her own death, and there is nothing. Nothing beyond her too personal question and my reckless abandon for the notion that she just needed to lie to me. To tell her yes, I wish that I would have. By morning, I found myself headed back to my car. I needed to get back to the gas station to find some sort of significance of it, to look for an answer, to apologize to Ashley. Hi, Matt. To say that I was shocked would be an understatement. Maybe it was the lack of sleep or the complete shock she left me with, but she was there, sitting in my passenger seat, smiling up at me. I need a ride to the gas station. Do you mind? I got inside and drove without saying a word. I let her go on about the weather, her dog, her car troubles, and any other mundane nothing should she could think of until we reached halfway to her destination. Whether she was a hallucination fueled by lack of sleep or stress, I had to make this time count. Why did you lie to me? She stared at me confused. I know who you are, I stammered. You were married, and you killed your husband, and you were the woman from the story when I picked you up. You were pregnant, and you had me drive you to the gas station. The police found... Matt. She stopped me, still smiling. I could tell you everything. I could walk you through my life from the beginning, reliving every painful memory and every single betrayal, and wouldn't make a difference. Not to you, or to me. You were kind that morning. You offered me help when I needed it, and showed me the first bit of human kindness I'd felt in months. I think it would make a difference to me. I could have called the police and turned you in that first night. And you didn't. There wasn't much I could say to that. It was clear that she wasn't going to open up beyond that, and in a way she was right. It didn't matter. I knew who she was and what she'd done. What more could she tell me? You're dead, I blurted. That was the one response I figured I was actually owed. I am. If that was all she was going to give me, then it was enough. If the zombie or the ghost or whatever was seated beside me needed one last ride, then I'd give it to her. The rest of the drive was silent. 
She only stared out the window as I drove the same path with the same turns and the same continuous stretch of highway that followed. We pulled into the parking lot and I braced myself for the question I was sure she'd asked. I would get it right this time. I would lie because she needed it. Can I ask you? I love you. Her smile this time was genuine. The tears that left her two bright eyes looked human. The kiss that grazed my cheek before she left my side was almost non-existent. Grasping to what little physical form it had left, but it was there. My passenger seat has been empty since. I'd like to believe that despite what she'd done, she's found herself somewhere good. Somewhere pure and warm like she was. Somewhere that's so filled with love, she never has to ask. <clears throat> red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. Whippity wine, that meme is now mine. Hip hop, skip bop, and you don't stop. <laughs> this is, I don't even know. Th these are like warm ups, I guess. I don't know what to call them. Woo, SpongeBob fell in the dookie. Master Chief, why are you at that McDonald's? Wait, why would I be? <laughs> Master Chief, why are you at that McDonald's? Sir, Big Mac. <laughs> I don't know, guys. I'm bored. To what, uh, this, these are just tests for now. I'm sorry. Let's, let's just go on to actually recording now. <laughs>